Somebody put that on Facebook the other day. They said, my pastor says this all the time. But we, we literally are living in a time where, we're, where we are watching this book lived out in front of our very eyes. And I don't understand why most churches are not preaching, why most pastors are not preaching to prepare the hearts of the people. Whether people like it or not, a pastor... A minister is a watchman on the wall. My job is to stand and look out ahead. And when I start seeing things begin to take place, it's my duty to say, Hey! We need to be aware of this. We need to be conscious of this. 
So I believe the Lord's directing me to just talk about some things the next few Sunday nights that, that, that we need as a church. We need to hear these things. I want you to look at the first verse and then we're going to pray. Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. I want to talk to you tonight about living ready for the cry at midnight. Lay your hand on your Bible and let's pray. Father, we love You. We bless You. We praise You. We honor You, God. We thank You for what we've already felt in this place. We thank You, God, for all of Your goodness and all of Your mercy. We just praise You for it. Father, I pray anoint me tonight. Send the preacher that makes preaching easy and effective. I pray, Lord, touch my voice, God. Even touch, animate me, Lord. And give, let the intonations of my voice be touched by Your Spirit. I pray, God, let Your Word go forth tonight. I believe it's Your property, Your, your will, God, to speak Your Word to Your children so much so that if You can't speak through me, You'll do it in spite of me. Let the Word go forth for demonstration and power. And we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus, the strong Son of God. And the church said, Amen. 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 God bless you as you see it tonight. I, uh, I wished I had brought it. I forgot. But you had to look. If you go back to that first slide, Brandon, the, the opening slide. One of the, the things that I, I have in my office at home that I, I treasure was something that my wife bought me. And it was totally unexpected. She came in from a conference that she went to and she handed me a little box. She said, open it up. And when I opened it up, I found, wrapped in cotton batting, a lamp that looks very similar to this one that's here. It was a lamp that was found in an excavation. It was a lamp that's very old. But it was a lamp like they would use back in the times of the Bible like this. I wish I brought it and let you see it. But every time I look at it, I'm reminded of this story. I was I got it out and was looking at it yesterday and just trying to visualize what was going on here. But this is something that, that this is a message that I feel that we need to hear, and this is something that the Lord is going to say to us tonight. When you read that first verse and, and down as we're going to do here in just a minute, you're going to find out, number one, that preparation falls on you. Don't look at me. I preach and teach from this pulpit. I've done it for going on nine years now. You've heard me say this over and over and over again, those of you that have been with me, that it falls on you to keep your barn clean. Not my job. They couldn't pay me enough to do that. I don't know about you, but I have a hard enough time keeping this thing straight. Me, talking about me. But it is up to us. Preparation falls on you. Look at that first verse again and you're going to see what I mean by this. Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins. Look at that next few words. Who took? Whose lamps? Whose? Took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. In that verse, we find that there's ten. Ten in biblical numerology represents perfection, the law, uh, responsibility. Virgins, we all understand what that concept is. Virginity is a sign of spiritual purity, separation, consecration, free of pollution. But it said these ten virgins took their land. They took their lamps. They took the light that they've been given. Philippians 2.12 says, So then, my beloved, just as, you, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only now, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That means that you don't need to be walking around looking at anybody else, pointing your finger at them, trying to tell them how they need to live. Amen. It's up to you to live your life the way the Word of God tells you to live it. But pastor, I thought we were supposed to be telling people, you can teach 
the Word of God and you can share the Word of God, but it's not... Listen, I told you this before. I told you this. If I could, if I could make you, I'd do it. I remember my pastor got me off one day and he said, hey kid, it's not your job to make them live right. He said, the best thing, and I've told you this before, you've heard me say it a hundred times. He said, the best thing I can tell you is when you start pastoring the church is preach the Word and go home. Now, I'm not going to lie, Brother Gary, I struggled with that. I went off and I thought, what's he know? Oh, don't act like you had never done that to somebody. I thought, what's he know? Then the Lord began to show me he knows an awful lot. Because what the Lord began to show me was that my job is just to share the gospel. It's to preach it and to instruct you, give you instruction. But guess what? Just like all of our kids, we don't always listen to everything we were told, do we? I was talking to a young girl today and I was telling her, she's, she's a young girl, she's in school, and she's moving forward in her career. And, and she's talking to, was talking to me about life. I've known this girl since she was about 12 years old. And she was she's in her early 20s now. And she began telling me about where she's going and what she's going to do. And, and we were just sitting there talking about it. And she's got a boyfriend, which I was in her ear. And I said, now what was the first thing Pastor told you when you first met me when you was a little girl? And she laughed. She said, well, I'll never forget it because you'd say it every time you saw me. I'd tell her all the time, Tammy, you don't need no hairy-legged boy. <laughs> I tell her, you need to get in a, you need to find your path in life. You need to find out where God wants you. You need to get that career path set out in front of you. I said, you need to get a job, get yourself established. And I said, if you're doing all the things that God's told you to do in the right time, God will bring you who you need. Well, she's heard. She's heard that. And her mom and I were sitting there talking to her tonight, one of the, this morning. And one of the things that we, we were saying to her was, you know what? I said, I, I looked at her and I said, I guarantee you I could look at your mom and say, I bet you could wish you could go back and make some changes. Boy, would we. See, here's the thing. Not all of us are going to hear. Not everybody's going to hear the instruction that God gives. Not all of us listens to good instruction. See, the Word's very plain to us tonight. The Word's very plain telling us that this thing is up to you. It's up to you. As bad, there's, listen, there's days that I can get up here and preach and I can watch it sail right over people's heads. I can tell the ones that get it. I can tell the ones that, that get it and they're convicted by it. I can tell the ones that get it and are convicted by it and turn around and get out the door as quick as they can go. Then there are those that are sitting there and they're totally oblivious to it. It goes clean over their heads. This thing, this walk with God is up to you tonight. The lamp that they said that they carried who took their lamps. The lamps represent the light of Christ within us. Each of us are responsible though for our lamp. Again, I refer to you in verse 1. It said their lamp. It became personal. In Matthew 5.14, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all that are in the house. Amen. Now look at this command from Jesus Himself. Let your light. Personal. Let your light. Oh, the preacher, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Pastor, we want you to be the representative. You need to bet no. You need to let your light shine. Here's where we get, here's where we missed it in the church. A lot of people don't even like to quote the scripture where Jesus said, Greater things you'll do than I've done. How in the world can we do anything greater than the Lord Jesus did? Well, there's more of us. All of us that have come into the, the, the body of Christ and been born again, been washed in the blood, we've all been given the, the, the Spirit of the Holy Ghost living on the inside of us. And if that Spirit of God is on the inside of us, then we ought to be able to go out and do everything that Jesus told us to do. Amen. 
And there's more of us, so we should be able to do more than what He's done. But here's the thing. He said, you are the light of the world. He said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You and I should be living... Did you hear me? We should be living a life that is evident in front of everybody around us. The best testimony you're ever going to have is not what comes out of your mouth, but is by the life that you live. When you go on vacation, you should live the same way on vacation as you do when you're at home and everybody's watching. Because if you can go off and live another way and act another way, and do, listen, that's who you really are. You're putting on airs here. But see, we ought to be living our life in a way that people see, He said it, see your good works. They should see you living in a way that gives glory and honor to Jesus Christ. It said that they took their lamps and notice this, they went out to meet the bridegroom. Preparation to meet Christ should be constant and ongoing. I'll say that again. Preparation to meet Christ should be constant and ongoing. This would be great, wouldn't it? This would be great. Come here, Bella. This is my baby girl. I can use her. It'd be great to come to an altar and let some preacher lay hands on you and pray a prayer over you and all of a sudden, you got everything you need. Man, wouldn't that be great? That'd be wonderful. Walk into an altar and let them lay hands on you and then everything just be right. And you walk out of that altar and everything be fine and you be ready to go. See, the Word of God tells us that we are to go about our everyday living preparing ourselves, getting ready. I don't care what anybody said. If you don't say amen to this, you're alive, faint, and your breath stink, and I'm not afraid to say it. But everybody in here gets up some mornings in a bad attitude. Everybody in here loses their temper. Everybody in here says things that they ought not say, think things that they ought not think. Everybody in here. Guess what? That just means you're a card-carrying member of the human race. And I'll tell you what else it means. It means that you are to be working on this vessel every single day. There's days I get up, and there's quite a few days I get up. That I have to get up and go and look in the mirror and say, all right, Lord, you're going to have to do a work today. Amen. A word that I was, a phrase that I'm, I'm saying quite often here lately is, I'm not feeling it today. But guess what? That doesn't mean the day's going to stop. That doesn't mean the hell's going to stop. That doesn't mean just because I don't feel it doesn't mean that I need to get up and go about my day and do what I'm supposed to be doing. But every day I'm looking at myself in a mirror. And every day I'm looking into the mirror of the Word of God. And I'm finding areas of my life that I need to change. There's parts of me, listen, that need to die. The Apostle Paul said, the thing that I would do, I don't do. But the thing that I want to do, I don't do it. That means that even if, listen, my God, if the Apostle Paul dealt with it every single day that he breathed air into his body, what do we think we're going to do? Amen. He said that they went out. They went out to meet the bridegroom. They went out anticipating His appearing. Now look at verse 2. I'm going to take my time and go verse by verse. Five of them were foolish. Five of them were prudent. Listen. There's only two groups in the church today. The wise and the foolish. You fall into one or two camps. There ain't no gray area. 
There ain't no in between. You ain't just all right. You're either in or you're out. You're sheep or a goat. You're a weed or a tire. believe he's saying that. There are people who go to church every Sunday and they are as lost as a goose in a hailstorm. They don't know Jesus. They don't know His Word. They don't know anything about God. They go because they feel it's, it's, it's an obligation They'll go and they'll sit through the service. They'll drop some money in the bag and they'll feel better about themselves when they go out the door. But when they leave the door and they go home, they live like hell and they live like they want to live. Amen. Come on. Oh, preacher, you're acting like you're perfect. No, honey, I'm far from it. Amen. I find myself every day finding areas of shame that needs to die. Amen. But see, listen. you got to get this in your mind. Just because... A person comes to church does not make them a Christian. You've heard it said, just because you go stand in the garage don't make you a call. Just because you walk out on a golf course don't make you a great golfer. Ain't that right, Brother Glenn? Me and Brother Glenn, me and Brother Glenn play golf together. We can talk about these things. Listen, just because you come to the house of God don't make you a child of God. How do you define that? How do you define that you're a child of God? It's the way you live your life. It's the way you live every single day of your life. But you just get this in your mind. Keep this in your mind as we go along. They all, it said they all were virgins. It said that they all had lamps. Outwardly. Outwardly, they looked the same. The difference was what was on the inside that made the difference. Verse 3 says this, For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. Now wait a minute. We've got a problem here. I can have a flashlight, Jeremiah, but if I don't have batteries for the flashlight, the flashlight don't do me any good. Without the oil, the lamps did them no good. It was just window dressing. So they looked like they were virgins like the others. They had the lamps like the others. But there was something that the wise, those five wise ones had, that the five foolish didn't. It said they took no oil in their lamps. What is the oil? We understand oil in the Word of God represent the Holy Ghost. Listen to me. There are people that are sitting in the house of God who some time ago said the sinner's prayer and they didn't mean it in their hearts. Oh, it's getting down here, see? This is where the rubber meets the road. We, don't, we get real nervous when somebody preaches this way. You know why I'm preaching this way? Because you need to search yourself. I still believe what I heard Leonard Ravenhill say. Leonard Ravenhill, I heard him. I not only read, him, read what he said about it, but I heard him say it with his own mouth via video. He said there are more people that will split hell wide open that have prayed the sinner's prayer than more than all the pubs in England and the United States put together. Amen. Because we've had preachers, Brother Emmanuel, stand in pulpits and say, just pray this prayer. Amen. And there is no repentance in the heart. Amen. Right. Repentance means you turn 180 degrees. Amen. We got too many Christians that have turned from sin, but they keep turning back. Amen. Instead of doing 180, they're doing 360. They'll turn from it for a while, and then they'll turn back. I'm going to quit doing it, I'm going to fall over. <laughs> you know, you can't spin around like any other. See, the Word tells us very plainly that there was a distinct difference in them. They had no oil in their lamps. Listen, there are people that are living their lives thinking that they're born again and they're not. There are some Christians, people that truly have been born again, but they're living their life without the power of the Holy Ghost. 
to help them maneuver life. Amen. I've learned this, and this is a good way to put it in our modern context, modern technology. Most everybody in here at some point or another has seen GPS. If you don't have it built into your car, you've got it in your phone. How many of you are going on a trip? You don't know how to get there. You're not sure about it or not know about you know exactly sure of your destination. Well, all you gotta do is punch one app on your phone, type in the directions, hit go, and it'll tell you where to go. You'll be driving down the road and it'll tell you in half a mile, turn here. Three quarters of a mile, turn here. You understand that the Holy Ghost is the GPS that God's given us? Amen. That every day that we live, the Holy Ghost ought to be telling us, you need to go here. You need to go there. You need to, you need to back up and turn around and go the other direction. You, you made a wrong turn. You need to go back over here. That's what a lot of people are doing wrong. They're not listening to the Lord. Said so they took their lamps, but they didn't take the oil. They had the appearance, but they didn't have the reality. Look at verse 4. But the prudent took oil in flask along with their lamps. They not only had the oil in their lamps, they took oil to refill their lamps. Do you understand that every single one of us need to live our lives? Filled and refilled and emptied and filled and refilled and emptied by the power of the Holy Ghost. You can get that sitting in your house, but listen, there's something about coming in amongst fellow believers and sitting down and allowing the corporate moving of the power of God to flow in our lives. They took oil to refill it. Listen, it's not about what you had yesterday. It's where are you today? John 8, 31, Jesus was saying to those Jews who believed in Him, if you continue, what? If you continue in My Word, then you are truly disciples of Mine. I got saved in 1962. You go to church? Nope. We've got to continue. I, I had somebody, I was talking to somebody the other, other day at the gym. Precious people I love. Been hurt in church. I've learned pastoring and being in church ministry. Church hurt is the worst hurt. They were wounded in church. Can't get settled anywhere, Sister Matt. They go here, they go there. They just can't. They, they won't commit because they've been hurt before. This individual was talking to me and said, Well, you know, we've been hurt. It's just hard to get back in it. It's hard to find a church. We just don't want to get, get connected again. You know, we, we love the Lord. We pray. We read our Bibles. I said, but if you read your Bible, then you would understand that the Scripture says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the way of some of is. I said, so if you're reading your Bible, you've got to cross that somewhere. I said, you're going to have to deal with that. Well, it's just... It's just hard. You know, I said, I know all about it. I, I remember what happened. I know why they got hurt. And I said, listen, I understand that, but that was back then. And I said, here's what y'all have done. I said, y'all have got out here all by yourselves. I said, now y'all out here on this island and you're trying to keep everybody away because you don't want to get hurt again. I said, but what you don't understand is that while you're out there by yourself, I said, the enemy sees you. And all he does is fire his darts. I said, You're not moving. You're not connecting. You're not growing. And I said, He's just hitting you again and again and again. I said, It's like shooting fish in a barrel for him. I said, Until you get over that hurt and get into the house of God again, and then begin to get into that fellowship. I said, the reason you're not growing, I said, you ain't got nothing to rub up against. Whoa. Iron sharpens iron. That's why we come together. That's why we worship together. You've got to continue if you're going to grow. Here's the second thing. Our choices reflect, listen, our present faith. Look at verse 5. Now while the bridegroom was delaying... They all got drowsy and began to sleep. 
It speaks volumes of the natural concerns and activities of life, not implying that anything like that's wrong. There's nothing wrong with vacations. There's nothing wrong with hobbies. There's nothing wrong with enjoying life. But when we start enjoying life and allow life to lull us to sleep. See, preacher, here's what I get from people. Well, it's easy for you. You study. You've got to study because you're a pastor. You've got to read the Word of God because you're a pastor. Honey, I was reading this book long before pastor ever got tacked on my name. I was studying this book long before I ever set foot in a pulpit. Why? Because I've learned this is my lifeline. See, here's what a lot of us men are doing. I'm trying to, I'm trying to stay with this, but you've got to hear this tonight. A lot of us men will get something and got to put it together, Brother Gary. And a lot of us men don't like these things called instructions. Don't you say amen. It's the truth. Am I the only guy in here that can put something together and have spare parts left over? The rest of you men that didn't say amen to that's lying. But the instructions are given to us and most of the time if you follow those instructions and you get the right nuts and bolts put together in the right spots, you're going to get that thing put together right. And it's going to function the way that it's supposed to function. Well, God's given every single one of us an instruction manual. And the reason that a lot of people can't live their life successfully is they never took time to look in the manual and figure out how to put this thing back together. Look at your neighbor and smile at them real pretty because I don't know. Don't hit one another. <laughs> but here's what I want you to say to one another. I want you to look at your neighbor and smile at them real big and look at them and say, you're messed up. <laughs> you are. Everybody in here is busted. Everybody in here has issues. Everybody in here is broken and fallen and fallible. And everybody in here needs to be put back together. Listen, we look at this and we remember what the thief on the cross said to Jesus. But a lot of times we miss what he really said. We look at him and think he just looked over at Jesus and tried to tell him to have a mental acknowledgement of him when he gets into glory. He looked over at him and he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I like to look at it sometimes and think that maybe that thief was looking at Jesus and saying, why don't you take the broken pieces of my life and put me, remember me. Amen. Put me back together. I'm a thief. I'm dying for what I deserve to die for. I ought to be here. But if you'll just put me back together when you get to your kingdom, I'll be alright. Guess what? When Jesus set foot in the hell. See, we don't preach on this enough. People don't know what it means. Jesus looked at him and said, Today, you'll be with me in paradise. It's not preached on enough and a lot of people don't think of it. They think that when Jesus died, He went to heaven. No. He had descended into the lower parts of the earth and stepped into hell. When He told the story of Lazarus and the rich man, He was not telling some parable that just meant something that, that was spiritual. He was literally telling a story that was real. If you ever read the Word of God, when Jesus attached a name to a story, it was something that really happened. He wasn't just making it up and putting a name on him. He said Lazarus was a thief. And Lazarus would sit at the gate of this man's house and beg for food. Man wouldn't give him anything. Well, eventually Lazarus died. Jesus said when Lazarus died, he opened up his eyes in Abraham's bosom. What Abraham's bosom was, was a place, it's a compartment that was in hell that was on the non-burning side. You'll understand this when I explain it to you. Until there was a plan of redemption in place, there had to be a place of holding. So they all went to this place called paradise or Abraham's bosom. It was a place that was not tormented. 
There was no fire there. There was no heat there. It was a pleasant place, but it was in that part. And all the people, all the righteous dead, those that trusted God, remember when Abraham began to follow God, it said Abraham believed God, and God just gave him that credit. It said, you're righteous. When Abraham died because of that righteousness, that righteous faith and belief in God, when Abraham died, he went to paradise. So Abraham, from Adam all the way up to that point, anybody that died trusting God, had faith in God, they went to that place. The minute Jesus said, into your hands I commend my spirit, he's finished. Dropped his head and died. He descended and went into paradise. Now you got to think, Jesus got there first. Now we don't preach this enough. Jesus went there and the price had been paid. Now before this thief died, because you read, the Bible said Jesus died before they did. The Bible said that He died, they went to Him, they were going to break His legs. That's how, listen, crucifixion was basically a bloodless thing. Just because they were nailed doesn't mean that they bled to death. Jesus shed His blood when He began to sweat Great drops of blood. That was even before the lashes were laid on him. He began to sweat and blood began to come out because of the torment that he was under. But what you've got to realize is that when they, they crucified them, they suffocated them. They crossed their feet. They had them at an angle to where they had to constantly push and work themselves to breathe. It collapsed everything on the inside of them. Pockets of fluid would begin to build up around their bodies and internal organs. Why do you think when they pierced his side, the Bible said, forthwith came blood and fluid was built up around his heart. That's why when they ran that spear in, fluid had built up around his heart. And that's what gushed out. you got to think that whole time he hung there, he was working. He'd have to push himself up to get a breath and come back down. Pull himself back up and come down. Listen, think about pulling yourself up on those nails. Pushing out with your feet. It was painful. The Bible said Jesus died before they got to the thieves. And when they went to Him, they found that He was already dead. They pierced His side. The blood and the water came out. And the Bible said they took clubs and broke the legs of the other two thieves. Read it. Amen. Broke their legs. Why? Because they were trying to kill them quicker. Jesus stepped into paradise. Amen. Now you know how this is just boy my mind runs. I got to wondering about that the other day and I got to thinking, I wonder when he stepped in what the talk was. Oh yeah. Who's this guy? Oh yeah. Who's he? Yeah. He looks different. Yeah, come on. There's something about him. What who is this guy? You know they all began to talk. Yeah. I, my way my mind runs, I got thinking maybe Abraham walked up to him and said, I ought to know you. I, I ought to know who you are. And I believe Jesus might have looked at him. I'm preaching, I'm going to preach it my way. I think Jesus looked at him and said, Abraham, you have seen me. You seen my day and you rejoiced in it. You did see me that day that you were about to offer your son. And you looked over and saw a ram caught in the thicket. You saw me. And Abraham understood. Moses began to come over to him. I believe I ought to know who you are. Oh, you know exactly who I am. I'm the finger that came down from heaven and began to inscribe on the stone tablets that you held in your hand. I'm the Word. I'm the one that gave you that. I'm the one. I believe they all began to make their way and I believe they all began to realize who He was. And I believe that paradise area began to get excited. Then all of a sudden, another man stepped in the room. And it was the thief on the cross. He was the first one to come in under the blood. He was the first one to step in, Sister Madge, and be walking in the blood that was shed for Jesus. From Jesus. Jesus began, the Word tells us that He taught them, began to tell them who He was. You can read the Word of God and what it says. But it said that He led captivity captive. In other words, He went in and shared who He was. They began to understand this is who we've been believing in. This is the one we've been waiting on. 
They all came in under that new covenant and He led them out of that. But see, you've got to get a hold of this. Amen. We're living in a day where people are getting drowsy and don't want to hear this stuff. I don't want to hear no story. I don't want to hear some old man stand up there and sweat and preach and holler and yell. I don't want to hear this anymore. It said that they all, while he was delayed, I told you this morning, I asked Sister Madge how long she'd been hearing preachers talk about the coming of the Lord. She said, as long as I remember hearing them preach. Church, listen. We've got to get a hold of this. While he's delayed, you've got to be the one to be about your business and not get into that place of falling asleep. Our choices reflect present faith. I've got to hurry. Verse 6. But at midnight, there was a shout. Behold, the bridegroom come out to meet him. Midnight. What? A time when we might not think somebody's going to come by. And I can take time to go through all of how the Jews, how their wedding ceremonies went, and I don't have time to do that. But listen, we should live every day. Every day. Like the Lord can come right then. I know that ain't popular, but I wonder how many of you walk around this may just take it the way you want to take it. But I guarantee you, when you're at home, you get up and you put clothes on, don't you? Why do you put clothes on? Well, that's what you're supposed to do. I remember when I was a little boy. I remember when Logan was a little boy. Logan would get in the door taking clothes off. I ain't kidding. That's Roxy. He'd walk in the door and be kicking shoes. He'd throw his pants to the floor and yank his shirt off. He'd strip down to his diaper or his underwear or whatever he was in at that time. And I was about the same way. But guess what my mama used to say? Son, you need to get some clothes on. Why? Somebody might come by. Well, you're not going to run around your natural house naked, not be clothed and not be ready. Then why do we do that spiritually? Why do we live our lives not clothed and ready? Not ready to be ready to, to be when he comes by. In verse 7, I gotta get this in a hurry. Those virgins rose, then all those virgins rose and trimmed the lamps. Trimming the lamps consisted of removing the charred portions of the wick and raising the wicked cell. It'd be followed by a replenishing of the oil. It was done twice daily in the tabernacle and it was done in the temple. If the wick was not trimmed, it would give off, listen, more smoke than light. And eventually it'd go out. Can I tell you there's a lot of Christians today in the modern church, they're giving off more smoke than they are light. Amen. Verse 8 says, The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil. For our lamps are going out. I love you tonight, but you can't have mine. Oh, I ain't got enough for you and me, the one. I've got enough for me. You need the Holy Spirit in your life for yourself. It's sad that most churches, the load spiritually is carried by so few. The foolish think that the spiritual or uh, the spirituality of others will make provision for them. That is not the case. You've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit for yourself. You've got to have a relationship with the Lord for yourself. Amen. Verse 9, but the prudent answer. No, there'll be not enough for us and for you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. Listen. You've got to get this for yourself. Yes. Don't get mad at me. But your mama's relationship ain't going to get you there. Amen. I've heard people tell me all that I had to pray to this mama. That don't mean nothing. Thank God that she was a praying woman, but that don't mean nothing for you and your relationship right now. Mama's relationship ain't going to get you there. Daddy's relationship ain't going to get you there. Mamaw's relationship, Papaw's relationship, your wife's relationship, your husband's relationship, none of those are going to get you there. You've got to do it yourself. Amen. Here's the last thing. Delay causes denial. Verse 10, And while they were going away to make the purchase, 
the bridegroom came, and those who were what? Ready. You mean you got to be ready? Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Now, they're about to start doing what they should have been doing all along. Listen. Seconds after the rapture of the church. I preached on it this morning. Seconds after the rapture of the church. People that have known the truth and heard the truth, been in church, are going to start wailing and crying and squalling out to God. Don't you know that when the door was shut on the ark and the rain began to fall, and you got to realize, you got to think about this. The Bible said up until that moment it had never rained a day on the earth. Amen. Moses said the rain's coming, or Noah said the rain's coming. The rain's coming. The Lord's going to flood this earth. The rain's coming. Rain? What's rain? The Bible said up until that point a mist would rise up out of the ground in the mornings and water the earth. Now all of a sudden rain's coming down out of the sky. And don't you know that the Bible said that when the rains began to fall out of the sky, that even the depths of the oceans and the depths of the earth began to open up and water began to break out and come up? It was not just coming out of the sky, it was coming out of the ground. That water began to rise pretty quick. And don't you know that the people that had walked by Noah while he was building that ark, laughing at him and making fun of him, were standing at the door. Open the door! We're going to die out here. Open the door. Moments after the rapture, people are going to be saying, Lord, where are you? Why did you leave me? The day, the moment that the rapture takes place, they'll break down the doors of this church and this house will be filled. Every church everywhere will be filled with people that missed Him. He's the one that shut the door. They should have been doing this all alone. Those that were ready went in with Him to the wedding feast. It means exactly what it says. They had, they had got themselves ready and they stayed ready. Then the door was shut. It's too late. Verse 11, Later the other virgins also came saying, Lord, open up for us. Church, I love you enough to tell you, you missed the rapture, you missed it. No second load. You missed the rapture. I'll tell you like I said it this morning. You can lock yourself into seven years of hell on earth. Lock yourself into the most horrendous days that have never that, that have ever come on this earth. Never has it entered into the mind of man. What's coming? They cried out, Lord, open up for us. Verse 12. And he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. I don't know about you, but those are the most chilling words that will ever be uttered to anybody. Listen to me, church. I know, I know, I, 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 I had somebody tell me the other day, Pastor, you preached harder in the last few weeks than I've ever heard you preach. Time to play games over. It's time to get serious now. Jesus looked at people, listen to me. They were virgins. They had lambs. He looked at them and said, I don't even know who you are. There are people that come to church every week that the Lord God Himself is going to look them in the face one day and say, I don't even know who you are. I don't know about you, but that terrifies me. What did He say next? Verse 13. Be on the alert, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Pastor, why are you preaching this? Because I'm not going to stand before God one day with blood on my hands. I'll stand before God with clear conscience, brother Ed. Two services today, I preached this as plain as I know how to preach it. I told you as plain as I know how to tell you. It's up to you to get ready. It's up to you to make preparation. It's up to you 
to live your life ready for the coming of the Lord. Listen, how bad do you believe this preacher? I believe it enough to understand that I, I could be standing in His presence before I go to my house tonight. Before we go get in our vehicles, He could come and we could be taken out of here and this thing be over with and we'd be in the presence of the Lord. I believe it enough to understand what He said in Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. There are people, listen to me, there are people that have stood in pulpits, Sister Madge, Men and people that people have revered thought that they were angels walking on the earth that were not right with God, were not born again, and they will not be there. There are people that think, <clears throat> y'all heard me say this before, thou thinkest thou art a what? A hum neighbor. Then there's some people that are just dangers and there's some people that don't even go into the danger category. <laughs> I say that jokingly, but I mean it in a serious way. There are people they are going to think they're going. They're going to think they got everything fixed. They're going to think that they did. But I read just a second ago where the Lord said, Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps. That means you're diligent to make sure your clothes are clean. In other words, the Lord's saying, make sure your life is where it needs to be. Preacher, why are you preaching this? Go ahead and stand. When I start preaching these messages, things of this nature, I hear an old song. I hear an old song echoing in my mind. Our Lord is coming back to earth again. Yes, our Lord is coming back to earth again. Satan will be bound a thousand years. We'll have no temper then. After Jesus has come back to earth again. But before that, He's going to step out on a cloud. He's going to say, Come up here! Amen. This earth's gravitational pull is going to leave. And these number 11s are going to leave the ground. And I'm going to go up to where He is. Amen. And I'm going to live with Him forever. Yes. And 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 for, okay, have I made it clear that we're going to live with Him forever and forever? Amen. But the song that we just sang, after seven years of being in His presence, after seven years of sitting down at the table and partaking in what the Word of God says is the marriage supper of the Lamb, there's going to come a point where the Lord is going to slide His chair back and a milky white steed is going to be brought to him. And he's going to climb on the back of that horse. If you don't know how to ride a horse, you better learn. Because the Bible tells us that he's going to come back on a white horse and all those that are his are going to come back with him. I don't know about you, but I can't wait to see that day. Because the Bible tells us that he's going to come back on a white horse, and all this chaos is going to be going on on the earth. The, the, the war and the battle of Armageddon is going to be taking, on, taking place, and all the armies of the earth will be gathered into that one spot there in Jezreel. The Bible said the eastern skies are going to split, and He's going to come back. We're going to be riding behind Him. Oh, what a possum. Amen. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but I close my eyes sometimes and I try to visualize 
what he's going to look like on that horse. Yeah. The Bible said that he'll have a name written, King of Kings yes. and the Lord of Lords. Yes. It ain't on tattoo. No. He'll have draped over his shoulder a prayer shawl. Amen. He is a priest, you know. Amen. He is a prophet, you know. Amen. He is a king. Yes. Down his leg, that seat seat, that string is going to run down his leg that signifies what his name is. But also, the Bible said his vesture will be dipped in blood. He'll be coming back showing very, the very thing, Brother Emmanuel, that the world has denied. Amen. They'll have no reason to say we didn't know. He'll still see His blood and they'll have to give testimony to Him. Yeah. And the Bible said that He'll open up His mouth and a sharp two-edged sword will come out of it and He'll decimate Amen. the enemies that have stood before Him. Honey, we're going to get to ride in and see this thing get took care of and we ain't going to have to fire the first shot. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Then, the greatest thing you're ever going to see outside of heaven is the Bible said, John said, I looked and saw a great an angel descend from heaven holding Amen. a great chain in his hand. But it excites me to know that that sorry devil, yeah. that slew foot, yeah. that liar, that thief, that destroyer, yeah. one angel yeah. He's going to bind him in a chain. Amen. And I beg God, I have. Yeah. If you if you ask him for this, you're going to get in line behind me. I'm going to get it ahead of the line if I can. Yeah. I've asked God, just let me kick him in the face. Yeah. Let me kick him, punch him, slap him, something. Just let me get my hands on him once. Yeah. But he'll be bound in the chain and the Bible said the pit will be on Off he goes. All right. This earth will be cleansed. All right. Jesus will ascend. Yeah. Walk into that temple. He'll sit down on the throne of his father David. And 1,000 years of eternal peace will begin to sit down on this earth. After 1,000 years, the Bible said that the devil will be loose for a little season. What's going on there? God's going to try one more time to see where people's allegiance is. Amen. And after that season is over, the Bible said the books were open. And another book was open. And the great, he said, I saw the small and the great come and stand before God. And they give an account to the things that were written in this book. Honey, everybody's going to have to stand and give an account to this. And all those whose names were not found in the Lamb's book of life, the Bible said, were cast in the lake of fire for the devil and the false prophet. When all this takes place, then we go to that last great chapter of the book of Revelation. I, John, saw the holy city, oh, yes. New yes. Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God like a bride adorned yes. for a husband. When all this is set in place, honey, yes, eternity has just begun. Yes, Where are we going to be? Yes, I'm going to be on a horse following behind me. Yes, I'm going to have a bird's eye view of watching this devil that is tormented, yes. cause more hell and cause more pain and suffering in the lives of people and cause more people to go to hell. I'm going to have a bird's eye view of watching him get what he's got coming. Yeah. But more than that, friend, I'm going to be standing right behind my Lord and my King. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you going to be? What virgin are you? Yeah. Are you wise? <clears throat> Do you have oil in your lamps? Are you living ready? Do you have your clothes ready? He could come before while you're laying tonight with your head on pillow. He could come before we even how did how fast did we learn this morning? Before in the twinkle of an eye, one ten thousandth of a second before you can even blink, he'll come. And it's over. 
Are we ready? There may be folks here. Pastor, you're preaching to church folk. Yeah, but you don't know how many church folk need to hear the Word of the living God again. Right. If I preach this way and one person gets right with God and gets themselves ready, I've done what He sent me here to do. But I'll challenge you again as I did this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed. How many of you are where you need to be? How many of you could say, Pastor, there's some things in my life I need to get right. There's some parts of me that I need to put before the Lord and have the Lord help me with. How many of you that are here tonight can say, I've got loved ones that need Jesus. I've got loved ones that I know for a fact that if He come back tonight, they'd miss Him. Whatever you fall into. Whatever category. If you need healing in your body, whatever it is you have need of tonight, I want you to step out from where you are and make your way to this altar. And we're going to pray with you. But whatever your need is, whatever your need is, Get out from where you are. Meet us in this altar. Come on, whatever it is, just make your way. Take a step out from where you are and make your way up here. We're going to pray with you. Church, I can't tell you any plainer that our lives, our lives, Need to be clean before the Lord to the best of our ability. If there's sin in your life tonight, listen to you, Pastor. The Word of God says, if we confess our sin, you ought to be able to quote it by now. 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If there's sin in your life and sin in your heart, confess it right now and turn from that thing and walk towards God. But I want you right now as they play some music, stretch your hands this way and pray for these. You don't know what, every, what these needs are. You don't know what all they've got. I want everybody, I want Connie and Gary to come, Brother Emmanuel to come, Pastor Bruce to come. Stretch your hands this way and begin to pray, would you?
tomorrow. Can you thank Him ahead of tomorrow? Come on, just thank Him ahead of tomorrow. Tell Him you praise Him ahead of everything you got to face tomorrow. Father, we bless You. We praise You tonight, God. Father, we thank You ahead of tomorrow. I thank You, God, that You're already in my Monday. You're already in my Tuesday. You're already in Wednesday. You're already in Thursday and Friday. And Saturday, you're already back again here next Sunday. Lord, we bless you. We praise you tonight, God. Come on, church. You need to lift your hands and bless him right now. Come on, just bless him for a minute. Oh, come on, lift your hands up. You'll feel better about it. Lift those hands up and just say, Lord, I praise you. Lord, I thank you that I got a home to go to. I thank you that I've got a good bed to get in. I thank you, God, I got food to eat. I bless you tonight, Jesus. I praise you tonight, Lord. I honor you tonight, Lord. I bless you tonight. Oh, come on. You need to bless him again. We're about to go home. It's early. Just bless him for a minute. We praise you, God, for what you've done today. I bless you, God, for the lives that have been touched and changed today, God. I bless you and I praise you. Now, Father, we love you. I praise you for this house. I praise you for these people. Father, I speak blessing over them right now. Watch over them as they leave this place. Watch over them as they travel home. I speak blessing over their homes tonight, God. I speak blessing over their bodies. God, I speak sweet sleep over them right now. Those that are struggling with sickness in their body. Lord, I believe a change is going to take place before they get home. Hallelujah. Monday they to be Oh, if you need healing in your body, you need to claim that right now. You need God to move in your body. Lay your hand on yourself right there and say, that's mine. I'm going to be different before I get home. Be with us, God, this coming week. Guide our steps, God. Help us to keep our clothes. Help us, God, to be watchful and waiting. Help us, God, to be anticipating. Help us, God, to be excited. Yes. That you can come at any moment. I'm thankful, God, there's not a thing in Scripture got to be fulfilled. You can come back tonight, God. You can come back tonight while we're waiting in sleep. But God, whether we're in the ground or we're walking this earth, help us, God, to be ready. Father, I ask you, as shepherd over this house, God, don't let me lose, not one. Give them all to me, Lord. Let me see them all there. Be with these precious people, Lord. I thank you for them. We give you all praise, honor, and glory. We ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. The strong Son of God and His church said amen. amen. Oh, come on, give God praise. Amen. Love on one another, encourage one another in the Lord. Remember, VBS starts tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. God bless you. Have a great week.